Good afternoon, financial professionals. Abby Fletcher here of E4 Insurance Services, welcoming you to The Brew, building relationships every week. Thanks for tuning in today. For those of you joining for the first time, we like to start the Brewcast by celebrating today's National Day for February 9th. Today is National Cut the Cord Day. And by cut the cord, I mean cable attached to your television. That's right. There's an entire community of cord cutters that experience great joy breaking up with their cable companies. We all subscribe to many apps, uh, streaming and the like, and often they provide similar, if not better, experiences than cable. Today, find your inner cord cutter and take a look at those streaming services. There might be some ways to save some dough. Today on The Brew, we have Eric Christofferson, an estate and business attorney who not only is a dear friend of ours, but a highly respected resource in the estate planning community. Eric serves as practicing attorney and managing shareholder at Grams and Christofferson, which has many locations throughout greater Wisconsin. Today, this brewcast is a two-part series. Uh, It's titled Beneficiary Blunders and Family Feud. For those of you watching this on replay, take a look at the recording before this one. Today, Eric will share real life case studies, allowing us financial professionals to spot issues in our clients' legal planning and steer them to safety. Take a look at the chat box down below. I'll be keeping a lookout for questions while Eric is live. Also, all attendees are in a drawing for a prize and we'll be announcing the winner shortly. Thank you for tuning in. And without further ado, Eric, welcome. The mic is yours. Thanks, Abby. Glad to be back again this week and uh, really enjoyed uh, talking to all the advisors last week and looking forward to sharing some more interesting stories here this week. So um, the last week's episode would be, you know, good to listen to, but by no means is necessary to uh, listen to this one because, you know, it's kind of just a continuation of telling more stories of pitfalls that we've seen in estate planning. And the last week we talked about a lot of pitfalls that can arise from marital status or the lack thereof. And this week we're specifically talking about a lot of problems that can arise related to beneficiary designations, um, as well as fighting within the family, which can certainly make those things uh, go much worse. So um, as you see from the title here, the part two is called Beneficiary Blunders and Family Feuds. So what I did for you guys this week is we do have a family feud themed So um, you're going to (laughs) see a few uh, interesting family feud clips in between the uh, stories about um, the actual real life financial and legal issues. So it'll be real life financial and legal issues, but also real life family feud answers. (laughs) And so um, I'm most familiar with the Steve Harvey iteration of the show, which is the current, and um, I love his facial expressions. So um, made a little one on there that says, the face you make when your client, dot, dot, dot. I'll let you guys uh, fill in the blank as far as what causes you to make that (laughs) face there. But um, it, it will be probably some of the things that we talk about today. So obviously, it's all about, uh, staying well-informed and making sure that you're giving the client best advice so that you and them are not uh, not caught off guard by some of these blunders. So getting right into that, like I said, we're gonna be doing a little bit of a family feud theme here. So um, same thing, like I said, true stories from clients that uh, we have encountered in our practice. So um, this person we're going to call, the first case study, we're going to call her Mary. So um, Mary was a divorced single elder woman, and she was a a great lady, uh, separated later in life from her husband, and they did get divorced. And so um, one of the things you as advisors likely do know and uh, advise clients on is, number one, it is critical to update your beneficiary designations following a divorce. And so this is true on life insurance, retirement accounts, all of those different things, um, especially when um, 
it, it, just a quick primer on that, for example, in Wisconsin, just so you know, kind of the laws that come into play there as it pertains to life insurance and retirement accounts. We do actually have a law in Wisconsin, which is very progressive, which does enable um, attorneys to fight over named beneficiaries, where even if a person is named on the beneficiary document, if you can prove that that decedent unequivocally uh, took action to change that, but didn't actually in effect make the change, that is, we have a law on the books that allows us to uh, litigate that. So that can sometimes be good or sometimes be bad, you know, good in the sense that you can correct things that were wrongly done, but bad in the sense that it gives attorneys another thing to fight over, um, where sometimes it'd be nice if the beneficiary on the document was a final, unchallengeable thing, um, except of course, in cases of where there's what we call undue influence, where someone tricked or uh, exerted great influence on an elder to put a beneficiary on a form, which we do have a case later, we'll talk about that. So uh, that's just an example of why a named beneficiary can never be the final say so. But in Wisconsin, we have even more flexibility um, where it's not just based on undue influence. It can also be based just on that um, unequivocal act that never actually got accomplished. So um, th this is actually one of those cases. And um, the situation here was this, uh, this woman had, upon her divorce, actually did do a good job of properly updating all of her beneficiary designations. So uh, what she did is she was um, newly single and her and her husband did not have any kids together. And so there were no children to name as beneficiaries. But uh, what she actually did was then named various charitable organizations as her beneficiaries because she said, hey, I'm not leaving my ex on there. Give it all to charity. <laughs> and so that's what she did is named these charities as beneficiaries on all her um, all her plans so um, and policies. What she then did, though, is uh, later on in life, you know, after the divorce, um, had met another gentleman who she did um, become very close to and wanted to benefit from her estate. And so she actually ended up creating a revocable trust um, and naming this gentleman as the beneficiary of her assets in the event that um, she passed away. And so, you know, she still individually owned it all, but, you know, if she were to die, wanted him to be the beneficiary, which, you know, very understandable. However, at that time, um, she did not work with an attorney who did what we call fully funding a trust, meaning basically actually designating those policies. So that's something we at our firm are very proactive on is whenever we work with a client on a revocable trust, we coordinate with their financial advisor to make sure that all assets are actually designated in the trust, which unfortunately is um, sometimes uncommon in my industry where people get a trust and don't really in a sense realize that it is an empty shell and needs to have assets designated into it. And that is what happened with this woman. She had individual charities designated as the beneficiaries, yet she did a trust document that named the additional thing that she did that was somewhat of a saving grace, which is not necessarily legally enforceable, but she did execute a document that said a comprehensive transfer document. I hereby desire to transfer all of my assets into this revocable trust, kind of a catch-all um, declaration statement, which again, legally, as you probably know, you need to actually change titles, change beneficiaries for those uh, things to be legally effective. But by her creating this trust, naming him as the sole beneficiary and creating this additional document that said um, she wanted all the assets in the trust, we were able to argue based off of that Wisconsin statute that that was an unequivocal intent on her part to have all of those beneficiaries directed into the trust. And so we were able to um, have this gentleman receive all of those assets. Um, and then it ended up being a win-win because um, per our advisement, we recommended that he, do, he did make some donations back to some of those same charitable organizations um, that his significant other had named. And so that's a, one of the outcomes of a case that I'm very proud of in terms of um, getting the right thing done, um, still benefiting some of those charities, but also uh, holding true to this woman's wish and making sure that um, making sure that her loved one um, did receive the assets she wanted him to. So that's a uh, 
you know, interesting case study on, you know, like I said, some of that is specific Wisconsin law, but the concepts that it holds true as far as what is the lesson to learn from it is proper estate planning with a trust involves keeping your beneficiaries current by naming the trust as beneficiary. You know, you can't just set up this empty shell and hope that it's going to catch it all. And you can't just sign this one paper that says everything goes into the trust. You have to do it on an asset by asset basis, which is you know, obviously important as a financial advisor to know where if you see a client saying they have a trust and you look at their accounts and policies and it doesn't say trust on there, that would be something to bring up to them and say, oh, well, you told me you have a trust, but I don't see anything about that on on your accounts. And the answer nine times out of 10 will be that they actually do have that trust. It's just empty. And the attorney who did it never told you that they had it, which again, out of professional courtesy and respect and best practice service to the client, we always um, send those written instructions to our financial advisor partners, alerting them of what planning we set up and what needs to be done on their end to bring the plan together in a cohesive financial and legal strategy. So, um, so that is um, the reason why we want to name the trust specifically as the beneficiary. Some of the reasons are listed here then. Um, it does allow for a full beneficiary roadmap, as I call it, which what that means is um, obviously on a beneficiary form, all you can do is list a name or something like my children or even best case, you know, like my children per stirpes. Obviously, a revocable trust is going to allow you to go into much greater detail as far as conditions under which who should receive what, what happens if anywhere anyone in that roadmap is no longer able to receive assets, where does it flow to next? And that's one thing that we as an estate planning attorney um, really spend a lot of time with clients on is designing that roadmap as far as how everything should flow under um, most foreseeable situations. And so we want to make sure that that roadmap is being used. Um, and the best way to do that is to name the policies into the trust. Um, it also, if the trust is properly drafted, can allow for creditor protection and divorce protection for the beneficiaries, which is again, something that we're very big on in our trusts that um, they're not just standard probate avoidance trusts. They also do provide that uh, asset protection for the beneficiaries. And then finally, it comes up less often with the generous estate tax exemption we are under currently, but in order for a client to uh, execute a disclaimer if they have a disclaimer trust, uh, basically meaning that if they would owe estate taxes and they want to set some aside into a separate trust, well, that trust actually needs to receive those assets in order to disclaim them into the disclaimer trust. Again, that's a little highly technical, but basically the long and the short of it is if you want the trust to actually work as a proper estate tax savings trust, if it was designed like that, it needs to also be named as the beneficiary of that policy which is one thing people sometimes do not realize is that your policies are part of your estate. They are subject to estate taxes. Um, and so it's important to um, do something, whether it's an islet or whether it's allowing for them to be disclaimed, uh, potentially important to address that in certain situations, depending on the net worth of the client. So our first uh, family feud here. Um, so Steve says, what might a blind date conveniently forget to mention about himself? And here's the answer. And there is Steve with his reaction. <laughs> so um, that, that was a, a fun one for sure. So um, our next we're, case- we're, back, laugh, we're laughing over here, Eric, just so yeah. you know, we're all on views, cackling, <laughs> so. <laughs> Wonderful. And, um, and <laughs> it, people are able to see that. I don't need to read the whole thing, Abby. Nope, screens up. David, middle-aged uncle to minor niece. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, getting back into it then, uh, making sure we fully utilize our time here. So um, the next, the next uh, situation, next example I have here is a, a situation. Again, we're going to call this, call this gentle, gentleman David. And so what happened was um, David was in his late 40s. So, you know, a relatively young guy and had a young, uh, young niece. And what happened was, sadly, his sister passed away of cancer. So it was a you know very sad family situation. We never like to see it when a when a young parent dies and leaves behind their child. But as you know, that's a lot of times when the rubber meets the road for our industries to make sure all the proper planning is in place with that life insurance death benefit, as well as with a trust 
to protect the child and make sure they receive that inheritance in the best way. Um, however, in this case, we were brought in after the fact and there was no legal planning established. There was no will um, to discuss guardianship for this daughter. And there was no trust to talk about when she should receive the money or who should be in charge of it. What the woman had done who passed away, you know, she had good intentions and she had actually uh, had talked to her brother and said, I'm going to leave all of my life insurance to you and then you can use it to take care of my daughter. So again, it, in theory, sounds like a sounds like a good idea if that were a legal arrangement. But unfortunately, that was a, you know, non-legal layperson's, you know, bootleg, whatever you want to call it, type arrangement where it was just verbal understandings. And so um, I always say verbal understandings are as good as the paper they're written on. And so um, basically what ended up happening was a supposed friend of this woman, the decedent, uh, her friend came out of the woodwork and basically tried to take guardianship over of the daughter, as well as tried to take control of all of the money because there was a fairly significant amount of money here, because again, it was life insurance death benefit, and there was a good amount of leverage in the policy that um, you know, paid, paid a, a healthy sum that was gonna be for the benefit of this daughter. Now, um, what this friend or alleged friend did was, the first thing she did was sued the uncle and said that he wrongfully had those funds and that that was proof that he was trying to keep those funds from the daughter, and the uncle was just beside himself because he said, all I'm doing is I'm trying to follow my sister's wishes. I've literally done nothing but claim this money. And it's sitting here in, account, in an account ready to use it for my niece. And suddenly I'm being sued by this person who is supposedly a friend. And she's trying to take guardianship of the niece, but she's also trying to take all the niece's money. And, you know, heavily, we believe that that money was what was motivating um, her to try to take guardianship. And again, that's that's some basic estate planning 101 of it's important to have a will which nominates a guardian because that could have been very determinative for the court um, in order to um, basically say, hey, yeah, this is this is the right thing. And this is this is who the decedent wanted to take care of her child. And so we can go by the decedent's declaration in her guardianship clause in the will. Well, again, we didn't have that here. Um, we also obviously didn't have a trust. What this, what this woman really wanted was a trust with the uncle as the trustee for the benefit of the minor daughter, but none of that was actually set up legally. It was just name the policy directly to him. And so um, what ended up happening in the end, we were able to get justice for this young girl and get um, a vast majority of her money returned to her and having the uncle take care of it. Um, sadly, the sad truth of our legal system is it did require us to buy off the alleged friend um, when we assess the cost of litigation and what it was going to cost um, to battle this out through the court system, it was essentially easier to, in a sense, buy her off, which, you know, some people say it's blackmail. And it's like, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, sometimes our legal system can be used um, essentially in what, what could amount to that manner. But um, we were, were able to retain a vast majority of the funds for the benefit of the daughter, have the uncle take care of her, and uh, get this uh, interloping friend to go away. So um, again, good, good, successful outcome given the circumstances. But the fact is, is the best outcomes are always going to be achieved by having that proper planning on the front end. So um, this is kind of obviously, like I said, the proper planning would have been a well-drafted trust with a guardianship clause um, for that uncle, naming him as guardian, naming him as trustee, um, rather than just having that be a, what I call a non-legal side agreement. So um, again, very important. A, a lot of times it's hard for people because, you know, sometimes people, as was the case in this, the woman did not have a lot of assets, but when she died, she had very good life insurance and then suddenly she did have a lot of assets. And so it's sometimes people who are not used to taking proper legal planning and proper legal precautions, um, if they do pass away and, and did take the responsible action of getting that life insurance, but did not take the responsible action of getting the, the will, um, it can lead to problems like this where it's a, um, a high amount of money, but a low amount of legal planning. So um, that's the, the second case study that I have for you here. So um, moving right along then um, with another uh, family feud answer here. So the question, name something 
that can ruin a kiss. A mustache. And I love the <laughs> face on, uh, on that lady saying that. And here is Steve's reaction. Looks a little angry, a little sad to me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of those, oh, you just had to say that, huh? <laughs> so the final uh, example I have for you guys then, case study, is um, two brothers. And, and these, these brothers were adult grown um, men, not, you know, not, not young guys. And basically their father had passed on and their mother was left um, with all the assets. And again, this is a fairly significant estate. And it so happened that um, Randy had gone off into the world and, you know, made his own life for himself. Charles, on the other hand, never really launched and was still living with his mother in his 50s. And so uh, Charles was at home with the mother every day. Um, and what happened in this particular case is that um, all of the previous planning that um, the mother had executed did say that she wished to benefit Randy and Charles 50-50, both of her two sons equally, and wanted them to uh, receive equal shares of her inheritance. Um, but in this case, ultimately what happened was Charles did that, um, what we mention and call undue influence, and um, essentially uh, convinced his mother, and we don't even, in this case, don't even believe necessarily that his mother did some of these changes because a lot of changes were done electronically um, because of uh, the various Vanguard type accounts and things that they had. But ultimately, um, what happened was um, Charles ended up being named as 100% beneficiary on every asset across the board. And that was the end result that existed as of the date of mom's death. And so, um, as you can imagine, when Randy found out about this, um, and again, this wasn't done via a, an estate attorney, this was just done via beneficiary changes. So there was no supporting will or trust to indicate that this was actually the mother's wishes. It was just all done by beneficiary designations by Charles, essentially, naming himself as the 100% beneficiary and naming Randy as zero. Um, and so, this is um, essentially one of the, the situations I described er earlier where the law unfortunately has to say it's not just a final say so of whatever the beneficiary form says is is final, you know, because in theory, you could hold a gun to someone's head and say, put my name on that beneficiary form and, you know, then you would receive it. And that that's obviously not right. So the law does for, allow for circumstances to say, hey, even though the beneficiary form said this, there was duress, coercion, undue influence, which caused the person uh, to do the form um, to not express their wishes properly, or, you know, even fraud where someone else forged a form, those sorts of things. The law does allow for forms to be adjusted um, in those cases. Um, end result of this was a, was a long, long legal battle. And the uh, main people who ended up getting getting ahead here was the attorneys and both of the brothers ended up getting far less of an inheritance than either of them would have if they would have just agreed to do 50-50 like what their mother wanted. So um, just an example of um, if you don't seek that proper legal planning on the front end, um, then you have to have a big legal battle on the back end. It's going to be worse. It's going to be worse for everyone. So um, the... <laughs> lesson from that story um, with, with the brothers is um, for proper estate planning, free of influence from children, work with professional advisors because professional advisors are trained to oversee proper implementation of those beneficiary designations of those wills and trusts. And like I said, in this case, there weren't, weren't even advisors involved in any of these changes. They were all done just, you know, mailing forms in or doing stuff on the computer. And so there wasn't even a single advisor who was overseeing that. And um, obviously financial advisors as well as legal advisors can take um, their own methods and precautions of oversight where if they do feel one of their clients is being tricked or influenced or, or defrauded, um, that's an extra layer of oversight. And certainly if you have a financial advisor as well as a legal advisor in the plan, then you've got two layers of oversight. And obviously this was an example of what happens with zero oversight. So um, that's again, one of the benefits we tell clients of having a plan is 
you know, we working with an attorney or working with a professional advisor, you know, gives you that additional legitimacy to your plan because we have our proper procedures that we have to follow that will guarantee that the plan is, and again, shouldn't use the word guarantee, will ensure that the plan is properly established. So, um, so yeah, that is um, the final story I had for you guys there. And then uh, final uh, little clue here, name something that gets passed around. This guy says a joint. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, poor Steve there. And this lady says, the collection plate at church. <laughs> and Steve says, I like the way you tried to stop us from going to hell. <laughs> so uh, sorry if I'm enjoying this too much myself, but um, I got a kick, got a kick out of this one. Always fun to see how different people answer, answer things very differently. So um, like I said, with that last example, nobody wins when the family feuds other than the litigation attorneys. So there's the, the parting thought for me today. So um, thank you everyone. That is all I have and I'll uh, switch it back over to you, Abby. Thanks, Eric. And super thanks for all of the family feud images because although we were all on mute, there was, there was laughter abound. Um, <laughs> Steve, Steve Harvey does act with his face. So I know what you mean by that. I've opened up the line for questions if the audience has any. And also, Eric, thank you for the knowledge today, both part one and part two of this, this episode is fantastic. Well, thank you. Always, always glad to collaborate and um, glad, to, glad to know that the audience is, is interested in the topic. And um, yeah, I think it's, you know, can usually learn a tidbit of something from listening to these as well as hopefully um, be a little entertained over your lunch hour, so. <laughs> well said. Let's go to the drawing, Eric. See, no questions. I'm gonna have you choose a number between one and 24. All right, I'm just gonna go 17. 17, who's the winner? Who's the winner? Oh man, Phil, you're the winner. I'm gonna try my best at your last name, sir. Scarigla? Ceriglia, Phil Ceriglia, be on the lookout for a coffee card and some complimentary CE coming your way from all of us at E4. And thanks for dialing in and be sure to tune in next week, folks. We're going to have our friends from Nationwide Care Matters, and we're going to be discussing business deductions for long-term care. Thanks for tuning in and have a fantastic day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Eric.